Okay, I need to start up. I'm concurrently streaming on YouTube Live, but also I want to stream at the same time on Instagram IGTV. So I, I have my phone mounted like right up here and I need to start that stream as well before I get started on studio time. Hi everybody, welcome. So now I have my stream running on both IGTV and on YouTube Live. And I'm hoping to keep um, this open studio happening in both locations. Um, the last couple times that I did stream on Instagram, I learned a lot about <laughs> streaming there. Uh, namely that you have to have a portrait orientation on your camera there. And I really originally conceived of this open studio on YouTube in landscape. So just know that I'm, I'm streaming both places and um, especially if you join me on Instagram but you don't feel like you're really getting a good view of everything I'm working on because the window is so narrow, it's kind of like peeking through a crack in the door of my studio. Whereas in the Instagram feed um, or in the Instagram live stream, you do have the entire work table, my dolly head over here, you can see, well, on Instagram, you can see Zelda behind me too, but um, you just have, I think, a broader view of what's happening in terms of the scope of my work table. So, welcome. I see, uh, I have someone on YouTube who's popped into the chat to say they're signing in from Arkansas. Welcome, William. It's great to have you here. Today, I'm going to be working on a totally new hat project. And let me show you my research image for it on Instagram and uh, YouTube here. This is a Regency bonnet that I found this image in an image search on Pinterest, actually. I was looking for strip straw Regency bonnets, and this one was sold a couple of years ago at a vintage auction, an auction site that deals in vintage clothing and accessories. And I really liked the shape of this bonnet. I've made a bonnet in this shape before, but not out of strip straw. I did it out of, um, I did it out of shape molded over a hat block that I carved which was uh, it was what the the show needed for what the designer wanted that hat to be but this hat um, I can choose what it is because this is not for a stage show normally I am a theatrical milliner working for Playmakers Repertory Company which is a professional theater in Chapel Hill North Carolina in residence on the campus at UNC Chapel Hill and um, hopefully some of my students are tuning into this stream either now or afterwards watching the video because um, that's why I really started this. They don't get to work alongside me in the Playmakers costume shop on the production of theater because the theaters are all closed. Well, we're streaming one person and, and, and live reading, Zoom readings and such, but the, the amount of costume production and the level of, of costume making that's required is not so much. So this stream allows me to make things in my studio and if my millinery students want to drop by and just sort of watch what's going on, they can. So I said I'm, I'm, I'm making this bonnet and I'm making it out of spiral straw, which in a recent video on my YouTube channel, I did, I have a series of unboxing videos where I unbox vintage hats from vintage hat boxes and costume donations. There was a recent costume donation unboxing that I did that was composed of a, a large quantity of vintage hats and also some vintage millinery supplies and tools. And this, there's quite a lot of, of hanks of straw braid here that came in in that donation. And it's not to say that at work we don't, that we couldn't use this braid, but I know for a fact that the straw braid box of back stock is overflowing. We have a lot of vintage and contemporary straw braids 
And we don't manufacture a lot of hats for the theater out of that. So um, rather than take this in, I decided to turn it into an example uh, project for my students to observe. I know a couple of them are interested in working in this material in a future project, um, but also to get more practice in it myself. So if you watched the studio stream a couple weeks ago, you saw me um, talking about a vintage hat that I'd found that was spiral braid construction about mid 20th century. And that had been crushed and the straw braid had been damaged in places, but it had this really beautiful med open work medallion as part of the crown of that hat. And at the time I said, I think what I will do with this is salvage some of the straw that it was made from where the sideband had been damaged, but also retain this beautiful strip straw medallion for use in a future project. And I was kind of thinking about this Regency bonnet idea. Um, so here it is. I've started, I, I, I spiraled back that pillbox vintage hat to just the medallion. Well, if you look closely, you can see there's maybe three rows of straw past that interesting open work here. Uh, that comprise the tip of what is now going to be the bonnet's crown. If you look at the shape of my research image, the bonnet that I'm inspired by here, you can see that I still have a, a ways to go. Like, like I've maybe sp stitched this one to where that ribbon begins, but it doesn't start to flare out until almost the base of that ribbon. So I probably have, I don't know, five more rows of this thing to, to sew. But in putting it together so far, to give you some idea of where I, what point in the process I'm at, I spiraled back the medallion hat and secured the braid on that little tip and then I began stitching rows of the wider straw braid that was donated. Then stitching those in rows lined up to create this sort of sideband of the crown here. And the first two rows of this, I had to clamp it and pin it and stitch it by hand. I was using a running stitch with a back stitch every three or four stitches to really stabilize that join between the vintage hat open work crown and the new sideband that I was creating with my natural straw braid. So once I got two rows hand stitched and stabilized on there, then I was able to get it under my sewing machine. So the rest of this construction happened on my sewing machine. Um, now that I just have a domestic sewing machine here in my home studio, if I had access to a, a strip straw, a sewing machine that was designed to sew straw hats like this, those machines typically have a, a very narrow profile for the head where the presser foot and the needle are located, and they have a very narrow arm. Like my sewing machine has a sleeve arm, so that is about this large in diameter and the straw hat stitching machines are a, a very smaller profile on up and down both both ends of, of the presser foot and the throat plate um, so that you can get more fine manipulation of even more narrow straws but for this because I'm working with a domestic sewing machine and I have a larger head on top of that machine than on a, stri a strip straw stitching machine. I had to hand sew those two rows before I could even get it in there under my presser foot. Then I stitched these rows as I'm going along, you know, spiraling it, stitching it, until I hit a point where it's jamming up against that upper part of the machine and I can't really, I can't get it under there with the narrow diameter that I want this crown to have. 
So I had to um, take it off. And, and now I'm going to continue to sew the rest of, like I probably have five or six more rows. And then if you look at the shape of this bonnet, it begins to flare back out in, into the bell of the brim here. And once I, once I stitch from about these rows here to maybe three or four rows into that flare, I will be able to put it back under my sewing machine and do it faster by machine. It's, it's, it's kind of a, 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 a weighing game of, of where do you have to do it by hand in order to create the shape you need to at what point you can get it back under that sewing machine to, to do it more expeditiously, quickly, stronger. I'm not a very good hand sewer, um, so it's it's always uh, difficult for me to do that section of the process. And if I were doing this for a show at work, that is a, a, an element that I might delegate to an assistant who was helping me. So I do also want to show you, so I talked about how I had this vintage hat that the open work came from, and I was able to salvage some braid from that. I had thought maybe I would unspiral it in this uh, stream, but I had the opportunity to attend a crafternoon reunion with some friends, and it was part of something that I did during that instead. But you can see I was able to salvage this much of the very narrow braid that that vintage hat was stitched from. Um, you can see it is like maybe a quarter inch wide it's very very narrow and building up a hat with this narrow of a braid is very time consuming you need a, need a lot of material and i tend to think of it as being uh, this narrow braid is to my eye very mid-century mid-20th century to contemporary um, it's not to say, I mean, I haven't seen every hat that was ever made during the Regency period, but I don't, I haven't seen, I haven't seen any made out of this thin of a braid. So, um, so I'm not necessarily going to use it for the structural part of this bonnet that I'm making, but I've kept it because it is part of my lacy medallion straw motif in the tip of the crown. And I might want to use it in some of the trimmings that happen later. When you take apart and unspiral one of these contemporary mid-century to now spiral straw hats, those are stitched on, I mentioned that there's a specialized machine for them and that machine, not only is it engineered to be mechanically easier to maneuver for this, but it stitches with a chain stitch so that you can very easily undo your stitches and then uh, restitch something or unspiral something very quickly. You aren't spending a lot of time with a seam ripper, which you are if you're doing, if you're sewing it on a contemporary sewing machine where you have an upper thread and a bobbin thread. So I wanted to show you not just the straw that I've salvaged that may go into the trimming of this bonnet, but the, the wad of thread that I pulled out of that uh, straw once I unspiraled it. it. You know, because it's a chain stitch, then there's loops that are still, there's a whole bunch of, of fuzzy thread that's still stuck in there that if you don't pull it out, then it'll look kind of hairy and weird when you reuse it. So this is the thread that I pulled out of this repurposed, salvaged, uh, strip straw and I'm I, I've saved this so I could show it to you guys but now I'm gonna throw it in the trash because it's garbage the last thing though that I wanted to show you before I move on to oh let me see hang on I see that they're they're trying to get my chat going on Instagram, but it doesn't seem to necessarily be working. If you're watching on Instagram though, and you can throw a comment into the chat just to let me know that that's working, um, and that these little error messages are no longer applicable, that would be nice. Um, so, 
I want to show you this pattern piece that I sketched out the other day, trimmed out. To get an idea of, like if you look at, to go back to this research image, if you look at the, the bell of this bonnet here, I wanted to get an, a three-dimensional idea of how big this bonnet brim was going to be once I finished it. Oh, I see Trisha's in there. Hi. <laughs> okay. Trisha's in the chat on Instagram. But this piece here is a, just a brown paper pattern piece. It's more of a mock-up, I'd say, or more of a guide um, that I cut out the other day to give myself just a three-dimensional idea of what I was shooting for with my spiral straw construction because you sort of sculpt these on the fly as you're making them. And I wanted an idea of what, what I'm going for. So I just made this paper iteration of the bonnet brim structure because this is just a photograph of an antique bonnet and, and I don't have a frame of reference for what that, like I can kind of see where her shoulders are and kind of see how this fits. You know, the, the crown of it juts back quite far beyond her back. But how big is this brim? This piece of paper gives me an idea. And I actually think I cut it to be two inches wider, like two inches deeper than this. And then I trimmed it back. And now that I'm looking at it on the camera instead of in a mirror, I think I'd probably want to pull it back even more. But it, it gives me a, a shape to go for once I move away from this spiral crown that I'm creating and, and start, once I, I pass the cylindrical part and start to flare out into that brim. It gives me an idea of where I'm going, what, what my finished shape is going to be there. So I've pinned, or not pinned, I've, I've used alligator clips in this case to clip down my spiral straw in such a way that uh, to start doing that because I hit the point in machine sewing where I could not progress any farther. My machine was just, it's not a spiral straw machine, so it just wasn't working necessarily. So what I'm gonna do now is continue to position this braid with clips as I go around until I get back to this first clip over here, and then I will hand sew it, and then I will clip it again, and then I'll hand sew it. and that, I think, is based on what this looks like compared to my head, what this looks like. I think I have five more rows that I'm going to need to do by hand um, before I start to flare it out into the bonnet brim. So I hope that one or more of my graduate students are able to see this particular stream either now live or um, checking out the video later because um, at least one of them expressed an interest in doing a strip straw hat like this for their capstone project. The way that class works is the first three projects we're just talking about different methodologies for hat making. We talk about buckram hats, we talk about uh, wire frame structures, we talk about blocking in felt and straw, but the, when you when you block in straw, it's, it's woven into a hat body and then you're just forming it like over uh, a wooden hat block or some other material of hat block. But this strip straw variety is a completely different way of making hats using straw in braid format instead of hat body format. So Anyway, the point being, I hope that the students, students slash students who might be interested in this kind of construction are able to check out some of this stream either right now or in future because I'm dealing with 
this process in a way that um, will hopefully be helpful to them when they are dealing with this process in executing that project, which, like I said, we have a ton of straw braid at uh, UNC Chapel Hill in the braid box. And so I would, I am very pleased that there are um, people who are interested in making hats in that way because we have some great braids, but for the stage, I almost never get asked by a costume designer. They almost never design a hat that needs to be executed in straw braid. So I think I said at the very beginning of this stream that I've only made three hats like this before. And one of those was cut before I even completed it. Um, we thought that the period shape was, the, the designer thought that she wanted that to that hat to be made with a, a spiral braid construction. Um, and so I began making it, but then she found one in our costume stock that she liked even better. And so I stopped where I was. Like I think I, I had spiraled maybe, it was the center of the crown and I had gotten almost to the point where I would start grading it down into the sideband. So if you imagine this spiraling from the center instead of having this beautiful open work, I would have maybe gotten to about right here before we realized, actually, no, this is not the hat that we want. Let's do something else. Um, and that is something that is uh, definitely true about being a theatrical milliner is you, you don't have uh, control over what the hat styles are that you might be making and you don't even have control over whether you finish one that you begin because you're actually there in service of the costume designers ultimate vision for that show and so sometimes things change part way through your production process or part you know they see it on stage in the tech rehearsal and it doesn't look right under the lights or there's someone else whose coat clashes with it in this scene with these lights and you know it 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 can be i think for uh new, people who are new to the job it can sometimes be frustrating for those kinds of things to happen because there's uh if you have too much emotional investment in the hats that you're making then it will not be a fun time for you working in the theater. Um, that said, I, I did not mind at all when, when my spiral braid hat was cut before I even got to finishing the shape of it. Um, I had the experience of working on it and I learned a lot of things about it that I'm now, I s subsequently applied to another straw braid hat that I had made that actually did get completed and that I am using now in figuring out how I'm gonna do this one. So, but that is to say, this is not a skill that I am terribly accomplished at. Um, and so I'm excited to be doing this hat as a, a stream project and just as a project in general. Now, I don't think, let me see if there's anything in the chat I need to address. Uh, Trisha says hi. I think William left. Um, no, there's no questions or comments. So um, this hat is a teaching example that I am making. Not, well, yeah, okay, it's partly a teaching example that I'm making for my current millinery students, but that's just the nature of this stream in general. Whatever I'm working on, they're welcome to drop by and, and see it. But, um, but I'm actually making the hat as an example for a lecture that I'm giving in March for, um, there is a, a company in Raleigh that does lifelong learning programming for senior citizens and retirees and such in the area. And they are offering, a, I can't remember if it's five or six lecture series there's one lecture a week on the the overarching topic is Jane Austen 
and characters in her books and how fashion and specifically millinery impacted their lives. Like, I don't know if you've read any of Jane Austen's correspondence, but she writes all the time about working on hats. Like, she was an amateur milliner. She was not a commercial milliner, and but her family was um, of a mid-income status that they probably were not uh, buying they were definitely not buying brand new hats every season. And she, I believe what she was doing is taking, you know, they would get a hat and this is your hat for the next five years or whatever. And it's up to you to remake it and retrim it into whatever the current fashionable style might be or what how your taste might change. So she often talks about in her letters working on her hats and I believe that what that indicates is that she was retrimming them with new ribbons, new flowers, whatever. So I'm giving a lecture in this series on um, how a theatrical milliner approaches hat making in general, you know, because we've done, we did a dramatization of Pride and Prejudice probably 10 years ago now. And most recently, we did a dramatization of Sense and Sensibility, and I made hats and gloves and parasols and such for both of those. They were very different shows, aesthetically speaking. And so um, I haven't written my lecture yet or made my PowerPoint or anything, but I think what I'm going to talk about is how historical style and shape and fashion influenced each of those costume designers in the costume renderings they created, but then also how I, as a milliner, interpreted them differently for different shows. And, you know, and I'm also going to talk about just like what the different accessories were at that time. So this bonnet that I'm working on now is hopefully going to be a, a, a teaching example because I want to get it to the point where it's an existing form. Like if, you will, if you've watched this stream before, you've seen, I, I do a lot of finishing of hats. Like this hat behind me, um, the black and white Tim Burton bicorn situation, um, it says I can't comment there unless I have my own channel which I don't have. Oh, that's crappy. That's really crappy. I'm sorry to hear that. YouTube, that's crappy. Um, <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, so usually the hats that I'm working on in this stream, they exist in a certain form. And maybe what I'm doing, like that one, when I first started working on it, it was two different pieces that I was pinning together. Um, but there was a hat that I had completed, completely blocked the shape. It was an asymmetrical top hat that we went through three iterations of trim before I decided how I was going to finish it. And um, this Regency bonnet, I'm hoping to get it to that stage where there's where I can pin out trim on it, give the lecture and talk about how Jane Austen would probably be refurbishing and restoring and replacing trims on existing bonnets that she owned. And then I can pin out the trim on this finished bonnet and in the course of the lecture, take that trim off and retrim it another completely different way. So that is the goal. Um, it says in uh, Instagram chat that uh, Trisha is multitasking because she's also uh, working and helping a student. So, uh, well, I appreciate you having me on in the background and, and we are having a little sewing circle here. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I will ever actually nail down the trim on this hat um, and, and make it a finished, stabilized, completed, fully trimmed out bonnet. It may always remain a, a teaching example I don't know. I guess it probably depends on if anybody, you know, 
sees it and loves it and really wants to buy it or if we have a show in future at Playmakers where we need a bonnet of this sort. Um, but it doesn't really matter because um, as a theatrical milliner, it's not like if you finish the product, if you finish the hat and it goes on stage and you get some stage shots of it, that's fantastic. Like not every, every project even makes it that far. So sometimes you're just doing the work for the sake of, of doing the work. And that is a thing that um, you have to be okay with or you're not going to enjoy being a theatrical milliner. So I, 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 I know I say it all the time, I'm so slow at, at hand sewing, it's, it's really, um, it's not one of my more accomplished skills. And I think at one time when I was younger, I was better at it than I am now, but I now am a 48 year old woman who has carpal tunnel in my hands and wrists and super bad eyesight. So that makes hand sewing slow going. Um, but I finished that hat, as you can see behind me over my shoulder. I can't remember if I had talked about how I finished it out. If I finished it before last week's stream, I think what I did last week was get it up to the point where I had like half the trim left to sew on it was so almost done uh, and then the stream ended which by the way this stream is going to have to end exactly at 4 p.m because i have to um, monitor a panel discussion this afternoon for our graduate students and probably some of the staff as well um in trying to determine how we could like rewind um let me go back to the fact that when the theater is working and 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 operational and we're doing plays on stage part of our graduate students uh coursework involves providing the costumes for those shows so if we have made to measure garments that are required for example, for our production of Sense and Sensibility, we had to make, I think, four dresses for that. And, and those were delicate, maybe more, but those were delegated to graduate students as projects that they saw from mock-up to costume to functional garment that goes on the actor that works within the context of the show. Well, we're not doing those kinds of shows right now due to COVID-19. But that means that we still need to make up for that course content, that that class still needs to, to be something that they do and get credit for and is valuable to them in their careers. So um, in talking that out with my fellow faculty members, with the costume director of the graduate program, we decided and, and with the head of the department, like, what can we do? We don't want to just come up with busy work and have them make clothes that have no purpose and don't go on any actors and have no fittings and so forth. Um, they did wind up getting to make some um, costumes for performers in a devised work that I think it, it may have already been filmed. There was talk of some outdoor monologues and so forth and, and unusual interesting costumes while they're doing that. And I, I think that did happen. But the other way that we uh, came up with for them to have something meaningful out of this is we put together a series of panel presentations on um, where, where our panelists are, are, are t discussing topics that are relevant to a career in professional costume production that normally we might not necessarily even have time to cover in the course of a regular theater season because of how hectic stuff can sometimes get in production. So our first panel was on um, publishing in academic journals and um, 
juried publications, and textbooks. And we had uh, published panelists who, you know, like some people who had written books that we have in our shop library on like corset pattern making and, and so forth. And um, then our second, so publishing, then our second one was, um, oh, curriculum vitae and other academic documentation that is required. We did small businesses, which Trisha, who's on the chat here in Instagram, was one of our panelists on the small business panel, which thank you so much for being part of that. It was great for the students to be able to, um, to be able to listen to the experiences of people who had started their own business successfully and were working in costume production on, you know, film, television, uh, casinos, touring shows, so forth. That was extremely valuable. The one that I am moderating today, though, is the fourth in our series of panel discussions. And, oh no, I think I'm, no, I'm good. I thought I was, I thought I was um, spiraling this up into a strange sort of configuration. And, and I am sort of asymmetrical. If you can see this, this crown is, the sideband of this crown is taller here and shorter here. But I'm, I'm thinking that will act to my advantage because when I look at my research picture, it's not an equal cylinder, you know, it is, it is coming off of the back of this brim flare at a kind of a, an angle. So I think I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm doing right by having that be uneven there. Um, if I, if I was not, I would, if I wanted to change that so it was even at this point from an instructional perspective, I would need to remove the stitching back to the point where I had an even distribution on both sides and re-spiral it. So that's part of why um, when you have a straw braid stitching machine that stitches with a chain stitch, it's easy to backtrack and rework the shape. When you stitch it on a sewing machine or by hand, it's just more time consuming to go backwards in shaping it. So I need to I need to keep an eye on that and make sure that it doesn't get way out of hand and super asymmetrical. But I think that given my research image has some asymmetricality to it, it's not a problem for me to have that as uh, an element in this crown that I'm doing now. But I was saying that um, I have to end this stream precisely at four o'clock because I do have did I? I took my needle out of there already. Um, I do have a panel to moderate and this afternoon that panel is on union membership and we have guests who are members of the, uh, the wardrobe union to, to do Broadway show wardrobe. We have um, folks who are in the union to work on film sets in wardrobe and costume department. And we have folks who are, um, we have, a, I say folks as if there are numerous people, there's like one of each of these examples. Um, and we have someone who is a member of the, um, the union for costume designers and associate and assistant costume designers. So, we're, I think it's going to be a really good discussion. I can't uh, share any of those discussions on YouTube because we, like the, the panelists are okay with us filming them, but in the fullness of time, I guess, if I keep doing this YouTube channel, I guess it's possible that it could someday monetize and then there would be, I don't know, legality issues or something. It's, it's not a huge concern of mine, but I, I did not ask any of the panelists whether they are cool with having these videos put on YouTube. So that's just not going to happen, uh, which is kind of unfortunate because I think that the information that's imparted there is good. And maybe in future, I would more formally turn it into something that's more of an interview kind of deal. Um, Oh, I think I might have just lost my stream on Instagram. Did that just happen? No, I just had connectivity issues. Um, 
I think that that would be interesting content to offer, but I think that I would want to do it as um, a more formal interview kind of circumstance instead of these these um, panel discussions are, are sort of freewheeling, casual, sitting around chatting kind of things. Um, and so I think I would want it to be not scripted per se, but just more formally, more formal in content than these are intended to be. I'm hoping, this is my goal for today's stream, I'm hoping to get my, this back crown of the bonnet, I'm hoping to, to fully complete that up to the point where it starts to flare out into the brim. So then I can do that brim probably by sewing machine in the next couple of days. But we'll see. That's my hope for today. Things always take so much longer than I think they're going to on this stream because I'm talking while I'm working and, and thinking extemporaneously about the things that I'm working on and the things that are related to what I'm working on. So I am definitely much faster at producing things in my home studio and definitely the theatrical studio um, if I'm not streaming. <laughs> like I, one, of the, one of the skills that I try to cultivate in my graduate students is effective time management and the ability to really understand how long it takes you to do something. Like, you know, you can't, Sometimes people will ask, like, how long does it take to, to block a felt hat? And I'm like, you know, so, there are so many variables. What's the style? Do you already own the block? What's the material? But just as a baseline, let's say that you have the block and you have the material. Like, I am pretty fast at blocking hats. So start to finish, it might be three hours, but with a lot of passive time in there waiting for sizing to dry or for steam to evaporate. But... But that's me, like somebody who has difficulty with that process doesn't mean they can't do it, but it might take them six hours where it takes me three and a half. So I try to provide ways for my students to, to really observe and record how long it takes them to do things. So like I had a graduate student uh, last year, actually, I think she just graduated in the midst of the pandemic, um, who was so fast at hand sewing. I mean, she could just whip through stuff. And her time estimate on a project that had a significant amount of hand sewing was way faster than mine, even though I've been working, you know, a decade longer than she has. Um, well, that might not be true. She started working pretty early in her life. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, um, it's, it's a, a helpful skill in, the, in theatrical millinery and freelance costuming altogether to be able to estimate how long it's going to take you to do something because time is money. And often, especially freelancing, if you don't have a clear picture of really how long something's going to take you, it's very easy to underbid a project and then wind up having to essentially work for free because you said you'd do it for far less than you actually should have asked for. And our skill set is so specialized that I think we off, but it's also people do it as a hobby sometimes. It's, it's easy, I think, for inexperienced Costumers who may be experienced at sewing, but not experienced at gauging their time and estimating how much work and materials and labor and time is going to need to go into a project. It's very easy to underbid yourself. And um, that's a real problem in the industry. There are so many problems in the industry right now because of COVID and, and being problems that are being illuminated because of COVID, because we are not necessarily working as much as we might want to be, but then we're also observing what is problematic about our industry. And so there's a lot of interesting discussions 
useful, meaningful discussions going on about sexism and racism and access and equity and classism in the theater and in performing arts in general. You know, it's not just the theater, it's film and television and opera and ballet and, and live shows of all sorts. Um, that I'm glad we're having these conversations. I wish we weren't having them because of, there's a pandemic and there's nothing else that we can necessarily do. I don't know. I mean, not nothing else that we can do. I mean, I'm working on this. We are making shows at work, but yeah, I'm getting away from myself and up on a soapbox here. <laughs> What am I at for time? 3.40. Okay, 20 minutes left to my stream. I may actually achieve my goal. So, at this point... Ooh, my thread is caught in a crack in my table. Um, at this point... I'm going to look at my... Look at my research image, and I'm looking at my crown. Yeah, I think I still have three or four rows to go until I've built it up to the point where I want to flare. You know, it's it, uh, there's such a, a quantity of this braid, but when I took it out of the bag that it was in and began spooling it up onto these hanks, I discovered that there, it, there was a lot of, of internal damage in that braid, so it it wound up being a significant amount of braid, but in several pieces. I think I have one, two, three, four, five. There were six total bundles that came out of that donation, and when I looked at it in the bag, I initially thought it was just one long piece of straw, um, which it's it's not... It's not problematic that it is in multiple pieces. It is, um, I'm glad that I am, am using it for this project rather than a student who has never worked in this medium and with this technique before, just because it can be challenging and reconciling a join between one piece of straw braid and the other can be challenging. You don't want it to be an obvious janky join there. You want it to smoothly transition from one to the other and the way that I tend to do that is have it slowly dip down. Well maybe I'll get to the end of this. I'll probably get to the end of this. Eh, I might get to the end of this braid. Have it slowly dip down below the surface of the row that it's on and then have the next set of braids sort of dip up out of there so that you don't lose, so that you don't have a, a bump in the ridges of your straw braid structure. Uh, but it can, it can be hard to do that smoothly in a, in a way that is, is beautiful and, and, and subtle. So we'll see if I can achieve that. <laughs> um, I may be overestimating my own skill there to think that it's easier for me to do that than a student. <laughs> I had one graduate student already uh, construct a hat with spiral braid this semester. Um, I've got one this time who already took this class when she was an undergraduate at UNC Chapel Hill. So it has been interesting to work with her on determining how, because you still have to take the, you have to have the course number at the graduate level in order to get the degree, but we've had people before who already came to us with millinery experience, and what I have done in the past and what I'm doing this time is work with that student on determining what are the hat making uh, projects or materials or techniques that you haven't had a chance to explore in your career so far, or that you have had a chance to explore, but that you know you would like to push a lot further. 
Um, so like sometimes, I think the first time that I had a student in that position, um, they really wanted to do a whole project on feather work, feather manipulation, feather trimming, burnout, dyeing, um, working with different feathers from different birds. And so we, we developed a, a project that was a survey of feather work techniques and they were able to produce essentially like a, a story of trims that were just different ways to manipulate feathers. And one of them, I wish I had it here, one of the projects that that student did was creating a, um, you know how in the 19th century, right up to maybe the teens of the 20th century, there were a lot of feather ornaments that look like actual wings or actual birds on hats. And in most cases, those were not taxidermized chopped off bird wings or taxidermized entire birds. Mostly the, the extant examples that I have seen, um, it's not to say that there are never any actual bird wings, but mostly those are constructed from feathers to, to look like stylized versions of what they're supposed to represent. And so this student did a, an ornament based on a historical one that, that I found in the New York Garment District where it, there was a, what appeared to be a bird head and a swirl of feathers that looked like a wing as if this were a, a bird that was curled up about to put its head under its wing, um, but it was very definitely not an actual bird. And so she um, created a reproduction of that feather element, uh, feather decor that was really, really beautiful. And she did it using um, reclaimed feathers. Like when you find a feather on the ground because there's been birds migrating through there, she, she did it with salvaged pigeon feathers and dove feathers. It was primarily gray and, and some whitish cream, some dark gray. That was really, really well done. I think I have it still in a box at work it, of, of antique feather tr or antique looking feather trims. I'll have to look for that when I'm allowed to be uh, safely back in the Playmakers Millinery Studio. All right, have to cut off my thread and thread up another needle because I have come to the end of that one. This is always tedious for me due to the eyesight issue. See if I'm missing anything in the chats here. Oh, someone's waving at me. See, good. I can't read your whole entire username over on Instagram, but welcome. Uh, Welcome to the stream. I have about, uh, looks like 15, well, maybe more like 12 minutes left. Um, I'm working on, just in case you're new here, I, I see I have a few new people who have joined. Um, I'm working on a spiral straw Regency bonnet style inspired by this research image that I found on a antique clothing auction site of a surviving Regency bonnet from the period. That is, if you can see it, there's ridges in the straw that make me think that this original one is made out of strip straw the same way that I am creating my reproduction. I guess it's possible that the straw was just woven to have ridges in it, but mine is going to be strip straw. And it's not, um, it's not, it's a teaching sample for a lecture I'm giving. It's not meant to be, it's not intended to be worn by a historical interpreter or an actor in a play, but I suppose it might be someday after I give my lecture on Regency, after I give my lecture on Regency accessories in the 
in March of 2021. I, uh, I suppose that I could put it into stock at the theater where I work at and eventually finish it someday for the stage. Um, or maybe somebody will love it so much that watches this stream that they make us an offer on it and we sell it. But um, my intent is to put this into, once I'm done with it, is to put it into costume stock at Playmakers Repertory Company. Which is the theater where I work. If you are new to the stream and you don't really have any idea who I am, other than that I am streaming studio time about hat making, which is what I'm doing. Um, let me... I wish I had eyes good enough that I didn't have to take these glasses on and off to be able to see activity in the chat in both of my streams here, Instagram and YouTube. Um, but fact of the matter is, I do not have good enough eyesight for that in order to see hand sewing and, and, and thread that matches my straw braid here. I do have to take these glasses off because um, I am I'm not, I'm new to bifocals and I, I find that I'm, I'm not getting used to them as easily as I thought I might. And even so, they're still not that great at up close vision. Um, I have always been extremely nearsighted. I think, I think I mentioned last stream, open studio time, that I got my first pair of glasses when I was still in preschool. <laughs> um, so eyesight has never been my strong suit, but um, as you get older, your vision changes and I think eventually, sadly enough, I think I am eventually going to have uh, deterioration of my eyesight to the point that I have to stop doing what it is that I do here in terms of that in terms of theatrical millinery. But that day is not today, and I am for now hand sewing this straw braid to create this bonnet structure. My goal for today, which I may or may not achieve, was to get this bonnet frame, or this bonnet shape, built up enough to where I can begin to flare it out into the bell of the brim and get to a point where I can sew it by machine. Because at a certain point on this thing, I where the bell comes out, I will be able to get that back under, under the machine. But right now, the, the, the crown is deep enough and the diameter is short enough that I can't, I can't get it, I could get it under the machine, but it would deform the shape of what I was trying to sew. So that's kind of pointless. Um, so I, that's why I'm doing it by hand now, even though that is not as expeditious as by machine. I do have a friend who has a antique straw stitching machine, chain stitch uh, hat straw sewing machine, and I had hoped that I could get her to come give a guest lecture um, and demonstration to my class over Zoom this semester, which was supposed to happen actually earlier this week, but unfortunately she was unable to make it, but happily she was uh, unable to make it because she got a job. So she had been um, the costume director at a, a regional opera company, which of course, as we know, much of the performing arts are on hiatus or just completely um, going out of business now, closing their doors. And so she had been furloughed from the company where she was head of the costume department. And, um, I don't know what she was doing. I mean, I, I know she has her own millinery label where she does stitched strip straw spiral hats. Um, and I think that had been sort of her sole, well, I mean, she's married. She's not the only person who's, win, who's earning money in her household. But employment-wise, she had been furloughed and was entirely dependent upon her millinery income. And... Um, was going to speak to my class, but then she got a job as a project manager with a company that teaches um, 
people who escape abusive home situations, um, this company teaches them handcraft trades and they make um, custom leather goods and, um, well, not custom like made to order, but they, they make a line of leather goods and stitched products and then sell them and then the people have um, a new skill and that's all wonderful. So anyway, we didn't have our straw sewing machine demonstration because yay, Hallie got a job. So, oh, I see I have some, my video ended on Instagram and I see that that's, that shouldn't have happened because it was not, you know, I'm still trying to figure out. I feel like Instagram Live only allows you to have 59 minutes before it cuts you off. Um, but I thought that I started this one on there right at 3 o'clock, and it's not 4 o'clock yet. But now that I'm looking on Streamlabs here for the YouTube duration. I've been live on YouTube for one minute and f or for one hour and five minutes. So I guess that was me sort of getting cut off on Instagram. I think that's my, I, I enjoy that I stream over there because there are a number of people who do watch on there. I have quite a significant viewership on Instagram, but I don't love the portrait mode of the camera angle that you have the, or the format that you are forced into there and I don't love that they limit you on the time because I often stream longer than an hour because I mean today I'm going to have to end it right at four because I'm moderating that panel discussion this afternoon and I need to prepare for that take us get a snack whatever um, but I do like that I can it, it doesn't always fit neatly into an hour's time. And I, I do appreciate that at YouTube, I can on YouTube, I can go beyond an hour. I, I think that you can stream multiple hours, you know, for quite a long time on YouTube. Um, but I try to stick to an hour just because I'm not sure that like if, if, if we were having open studio time, for example, like there's the local artist guild has open studio time, but that is a sort of a drop into the studio, hang out, see what people are working on, maybe buy some of their artwork. When I attend those open studio times, there's, it's a window of maybe three hours in an afternoon when people can show up and, and people drop in and people leave and, and it's, it's very informal and I, I, I feel like the nature, that's what I want this studio stream to be. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm shooting for. And I, I don't like that I'm limited on Instagram, but I, I love that it's a whole different audience of people who follow me on Instagram and sometimes they don't really care anything about what the open studio topic is. They're just there to sort of socialize with me because we know each other. Um, and I think on Instagram or on uh, YouTube, because my channel is very specific to costume craft work production, um, instructional videos and so forth, that more of my subscribers on YouTube are here for what is happening. And, and if they like my personality, that's great, but they're, they're really interested in what it, the knowledge that I'm imparting when I'm working on something. So anyway, that's a digression. That is uh, me just talking to the universe about what this stream is. I'm coming up on the end of my time here. I do want to mention that this uh, image in the corner of the stream is theoretically a tip jar that you could click on and, and leave me a gratuity if you've found this useful. So um, please do that if you're interested. But I don't really expect it. Like I took a class on streaming. They suggested the, the woman who taught it suggested that we create one of these so that people have an opportunity to give you some uh, remuneration if, if they wish, but I, I would be doing this regardless. So that's kind of a thing that it's like, okay, it's there. Um, I do this stream every Thursday afternoon, 3 p.m. to 4 ish. 
and uh, every Monday I drop a new video on the channel. So this Monday that video is going to be about folding fan vocabulary, terminology that you use when you talk about the parts and styles of folding fan mechanisms. So that'll be Monday afternoon by 4 p.m. Lately I've been uploading a little bit early because there's just been things that come up right at that time. Um, so anyway, uh, please subscribe to my channel for future notification for notifications on future streams. You can hit the bell for those notifications. And uh, thank you for spending this hour with me in my studio this afternoon. I'm gonna cut this off now.